Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the desert we tell. And it's episode 162. Ta-da! Hooray! Ta-da! It is a time for hurrahs. It is always time for hurrahs, surely. Exactly, yes. Mm. How are you, Nick? Toasty. Toast, it is warm. It is toasty. It's still toasty. Yes. It's yeah. just summer now, as you have rightly pointed out. Yes, but it's still not going to stop me saying, oh, God, it's so hard. <laughs> uh, I mean, though, what is a bonus is that we've hit the solstice. We've hit the longest day. So it, yeah. it's now almost Christmas. <laughs> it's downhill from now on. See, I started the day on the solstice sending a message going, happy solstice, wonderful celebration of the light. We're going into the... And you just immediately like, it's all darkness from <laughs> here on in. It all gets worse from now. <laughs> so, happy solstice, everybody. The Yay! night starts drawing in, <laughs> gets darker. We'll all be dead soon. We've still got quite a lot of summer to go. Fine. And many a harvest. <laughs> yes. We do. We have three harvest festivals coming up. They're very important. Right. And what will you be harvesting? Liquor. <laughs> You'll be harvesting. Souls in your <laughs> reaping ways. Yes, I've tried. God help me, I have tried. But people tend to run when I come at them yeah, with a the scythe. scythe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll just be harvesting miniatures from the shelves of shops and paying for them. <laughs> it made it sound like I'm stealing them. Yeah, you did, didn't you? Just like sweeping your arm across shelves. Well, until it gets to October when I will be harvesting all the pumpkins. The pumpkins. We're so, not yes. there yet. Not that every day is pumpkin day. <laughs> <laughs> but you're well, we're hot. It's, it's unfortunate now that we are filming excerpts of these episodes because we can't now hide the sweatiness. <laughs> Before we were able to sort of dab ourselves down with towels and fan ourselves and... Yes. Just just be be sweaty, but now just we have to look vaguely presentable. We don't normally do them nude or anything like that, do we? <laughs> but I don't know, normally we could probably just have like a scruffy t-shirt and I just like slick my hair back and everything. But Is then that this... not what you've done? Oh! I thought that's the look we were going... <laughs> you walked into that one. <laughs> you look lovely. I've decided to take your barbs with gentle humour. And poison. But yes, for those who don't know, we are now creating video highlights of our episodes, not including the main story, but a little bit of behind the scenes content, some outtakes and the best bits so you can see our lovely faces. Yeah, I may stick my finger in it. It's really itchy. Exactly. Yes. Really Nick itchy. does really weird things when I turn on a camera. Yeah. Normally he's quite passive. Suddenly he's singing, he's dancing. Singing, dancing, <laughs> a jolly time. <laughs> Stripping off. It's, it's all very dramatic. We tried to stop that and yeah. uh, he said it was for the good of the nation. It, so. it, it truly is. Yeah, and, and weirdly, our Patreon subscriptions just shot through the <laughs> roof then. These video highlights are on Patreon for the time being. We are going to be looking at composite versions for YouTube. But if you would like to catch up with us every week in video format, do come and join us on Patreon. Any poisonings this week apart from <laughs> me, my heart? Me, apparently soon. Yes. <laughs> but apart from that, no. Apart from that, no. No, apart no, 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 don't believe so. Don't We've believe got so. an adventure coming up this weekend. We do. Ooh. Yes, very exciting. It's a very exciting adventure. Going to see Eddie Izzard. I know. One woman show. Great expectations. Very exciting. That is very exciting. Sold out in New York, didn't it? It did. Had and rave reviews. We don't. We don't often have a trip to the London town. We have. It's been a long time. And also, also uh, getting older. I'm just really lazy. <laughs> I mean, that's mainly what it comes down to. Really, is that I just can't be bothered. We did do the classic introvert made plans a month ago, and now I'm laughing at myself. What a month or two ago, we were like, oh, we'll spend a weekend up in London. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're going to get a fancy. Oh, we'll go here we'll, we'll go, go there we'll go up on the friday we'll do two nights yeah we'll spend the day wandering yeah now it's questionable whether we'll even get to the theater so it's theater show home yeah maybe a cocktail maybe if there's somewhere nice at the train station with seats <laughs> with seats i cannot stress that enough i ain't standing for nothing no absolutely <laughs> and it's gonna be london and it's hot it is it's the hot 20, it's gonna be 28, it's gonna be like 28 degrees, degrees. And I did look, and the theatre the theater has air cooling, but not air conditioning. That's that's a cat with a fan, Which I mean, I mean, yeah, there's there's an usher at the back with a fan. <laughs> so, it's not going to be good. Well, it will be good. But it'll, it'll be... <laughs> see, you see what we're doing already? Oh, should we just not bother going? Should we just stay home? <laughs> yeah, let's not see this world-beating piece of theatre with one of our favourite comics and actors of all there's time. There's something on Netflix I want to watch. <laughs> 
I could only watch it on Saturday. We could re-watch American Dad and get exactly. a bit of chicken. We could go to the Parrot and have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going out. Adventures. We're, we're, and we're going to a bloody matinee, people. This is a... what we're complaining about. It's at 2.30 in the afternoon. Don't do evening shows anymore. <laughs> no, Don't you do. had to run once. and Yeah, not in London. London heard oh, of it. <laughs> absolutely, that was miserable. Is it really that bad? How far did you have to run? Oh, miles. Was it just the length of St Pancras? Maybe. Right. Yes. <laughs> I'm lazy and really unfit. <laughs> it almost killed me. <laughs> but you survived that. I think I was still out of breath by the time I got to Ashford. <laughs> still still sitting there going... <gasps> it was not a good look. Well, pray for us, anyway, people, yes. and, our, and our dreadful, dreadful jaunt to the lovely London town. <laughs> terrible, terrible time going to see something lovely in the theatre. Awesome. Speaking of sweating uncontrollably, but uh, looking fabulous while you do it, well, I obviously. think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. We certainly should. So thank you very much this week to Ziki Lung. To Catherine Goodwin. Uh, to Dr. Glowcat. Ooh. To Tonio Cotillo Rigby. To York and Nibble, the crime fighting duo. Oh my god. To Jeannie Ritter. Ta-da! Thank, Thank you very you. much, darlings. Marvellous names as always. People with your regular names as well. They're marvellous. They're marvellous. We love all the names. But also I'm quite liking the crime fighting duo that we've Ooh, now. Oh yeah. We need to know of your adventures. Absolutely. I, I think possibly the crimes of Dr. Glowcat, who is obviously some sort of super villain. Oh my god! <laughs> is that what's happened? Is that where they're chasing each other through Patreon subscriptions? It's a very, very long drawn out yeah, battle absolutely. that they're doing. But they're you go for it. I highly approve. <laughs> Beautiful Patreon subscribers. Uh, we had fun this week on Patreon. Did we? You never remember what we do. I no, it was so long ago. To be honest, it's it's literally three seconds before I say what we did that I remember yeah. what we did. I'm still thinking, still padding right now. Oh, Mary. Mary, Mary Creighton. Mary, that's the one. Yes. Yes. We did the story of Mary Creighton, often requested from people, actually. Mm. Yeah, dark in places, uh, but, yeah. but quite interesting, quite a, no, quite a weird one. Intriguing one. one. Good old-fashioned poisoning it was. Who doesn't love that? There's been arsenic alarms are plenty over on Patreon of late. Mm. Well, if you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please do consider joining us on Patreon for extra episodes every single week, extra bonus content, videos, and a new couple of cocktails from the Cabinet Instructional mm. videos coming out Instruction- very soon. Instructionals. Instructionals, yes. <laughs> I could have just ended there. <laughs> could have done. You're turning into me. No, I must add more words. <laughs> I must add more words. <laughs> Why say it once when you can say it five times? Exactly. <laughs> just sweat just dripped down my back. Oh, just, you know. I don't lean back onto my, my <laughs> fabric chairs. It's hot. Get cooler chairs. <laughs> Get ice chairs. <laughs> Chisel them before I come round. Do I have to tell you everything? Get less sweaty bits. Oh, bits. Oh, come <laughs> on. The back is not a bit. It is it's a bit. A, it's an it's intrinsic a, part. It's a bit. Of, well, as bits are. Right. So, so all still, of my body still, is just bits. Uh, yes. Just bits that are conglomerated together <laughs> as is everyone I feel not, right. ju- not just you so I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you're some sort of Frankenstein sort of or just like the t- the, the villain in the Terminator 2 just sort of just <laughs> assimilating out of Mercury no I wasn't going with that good yeah. good I know where I stand <laughs> well Nick are you ready <laughs> don't think you are by sounds weird I'm just sweating away here there's not much of me left <laughs> to drink cocktails and talk about poison yes or could drink poison and talk about cocktails. Okay. I'm not sure which one's best. I don't know you're, either. You're, you're staring at me in a scary way. I want a cocktail. Cocktail time? Yeah, yeah that sounds like a good idea. It is Nick's story again this <gasps> I week. I know, aren't you lucky? He has struggled. He has worked his little fingers to the bone. I have. I have no fingers left. And we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have his story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and it will flavour our cocktail of the week. Nick's story, so his pick. And this week's secret ingredient is... Is Brazil. Brazil. The whole country. An entire country. Entire country distilled into one cocktail. Yes. Now, I don't mind a country-based ingredient. Well, yeah, mm, I, well mm, I kicked off the first time. Yeah, I was saying, you did not... Uh, how well does Sicily go down? We were young. <laughs> we were young and inexperienced. Inexperienced. I didn't only know the we... ways of the world. <laughs> if only we knew then, what we know now. <laughs> Pretty much. But it opens up so much. There we go. So much possibility. And Brazil, lovely, feels, oh, exciting. Yes. It's a place of waxes. No. <laughs> waxes and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually technically a seed. 
Oh, that's the kind of cool talk that absolutely would have me accepted in Brazil. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be welcome in all the trendiest places. <laughs> Exciting. Okay, with Brazil, then mm-hmm. is the inspiration, the ingredient. Yes. What have you come up with? Well, for our first trip to Brazil, which I think it is our first trip to Brazil. I think it is. We haven't. We don't really delve into South America well, no, that much. Maybe not. once or twice on Patreon. So we are having. Okay. As we should have a caipirinha. Oh, oh, the, the Brazilian drink. The national drink of Brazil. Is it actually the it national is, drink? It is actually the national drink of Brazil. Oh, that's brilliant. Yep. Caipirinha. I can never pronounce it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And I've never made it. No, neither and have it I. And is, it is a mystery to me. It's something I only I'm, ever have on I holiday. I'm intrigued by this. So I'm quite looking forward oh, to making it. Exciting. It's nice to have a classic. Yes. Everyone can get on board with. Absolutely. And suitable for the heat, I feel. Wonderful. We should mix this up. I'm going to take off my trousers. and Delightful. I think it is high time for us to skip into the Poisoner's Cabinet Kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back! Hello! Well, Nick, we have our caipirinhas. 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 I've been saying it wrong for years. I could also ask Calibi. What's more likely, that I'm saying it wrong or you're saying <sighs> is, it wrong? This is very true. This is true. Now, right. I'll, I'll hazard a guess of what's in it. Okay, give it a go. Because I can see. <laughs> I was blessed with eyes. Well done. It's got limes in it. Limes. And this one's, it's got to have the lime pieces in the glass. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yes, you've yes. got to have it all squished up. All squished up. And then I'm going to venture the, the Brazilian liquor, the spirit... Cachaça? Cachaça. 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 Yes, which we've had once before. We've used, yes, we've used once or twice before. Yeah, Not yeah. Often, with the sugar cane. Tis. Yes, indeed. Yes. It's, a, it's a Brazilian rum, basically. But it's oh. made with the sugar cane rather than sort of Caribbean rum is made with molasses. Yeah. This is made with the uh, sugar cane. It looks good. Smells good. You'd step over your own mother just to get one. <laughs> All right. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Show up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, really... that'll, that'll clear things out. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, it's... <laughs> Sorry, Nick. It's really sharp. It is. <laughs> it's nice. That's a lot of lime, mate. Oh. That's a lot of lime. Oh, I can see my ancestors. <laughs> I was expecting to be lulled in with a sort of limey booty. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. no, no I've no. not really had many no, of, no, of these no. before. I mean, I think suppose the the sweetness is entirely down to personal preference. And because I okay. looked at I looked at four or five different recipes for this, and I watched a couple of YouTube people making them, and all of them put different quantities of sugar. And we're not normally sweet toothy people. No, indeed. Um, no. so, and I actually put more than some people recommended, less less than others. Yeah, very much a personal thing. Okay, uh, second sip. Would you care for some more sugar? Second sip. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. I can cope. I can. What's up to you? If you, if you prefer more, then have more. It's, it's really nice. It's lovely. It's just lime. And I love a sharp drink. The Kashas Ha Ha spirit isn't as strong as tequila so no. i'm used to having limey drinks but with a really powerful spirit cutting through it however i don't know what else is in this apart from sugar maybe is there anything else no that's it that's it okay that's explaining why my my jaw is starting to seize up <laughs> lime sugar and cahasa so what are the quantities so you have a lime a <laughs> lime each each okay so yep yeah. so basically you quarter a lime Take off the, you know, down the centre of a lime, you've got a like little run of pith going down the centre. Yeah, so a you, vein. Yeah, like a vein going down the middle. Scrape that out. Uh-huh. So cut that out. And then your lime quarters go into the bottom of your glass. You then put your sugar on top of that. Uh-huh. A lot of people say you need to use powdered sugar. It's also not sugar syrup, but a actual proper real sugar. In the UK, we would call it an icing sugar, like a really fine powdered sugar. Yeah, like a com- uh, I guess in America, confectioner sugar. sugar, sugar I yeah. Think they, yeah, it's called. Other people say it needs to be like a granulated sugar. Other mm-hmm. people more say it should be a brown sugar. Some people, yeah, some people say it needs to be really, really smooth. Some people say it needs to be quite coarse, so it gets abrasive that you're smashing it yeah. lines with. So there's as many. People who make caipirinhas make them in that many different ways. Mm. <laughs> so, Indeed. Um, so it's entirely down to personal preference. I use, say, yeah, confectioner's icing sugar in this and had two big bar spoons went into each mm. glass. Which should seem like enough. It's not for me. Fair enough. It. But no, no criticism there at all. But I, I think I've, I've previously had these cocktails with granulated sugar. Yeah. 
And I think with icing sugar, you need quite a lot of it. Because weirdly, icing sugar, sweet as it is, and it goes in some of the sweetest of all icing and everything, <laughs> is that you need a fuck ton of it. So maybe it's just not quite as sweet as if you did a big old heap of granulated sugar. So yeah, it's lovely. It's limey, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I feel like I've done drugs. I'm just because I <laughs> keep kind of moving my jaw and like... Oh, uh, run, uh, run, run in. And, shall I? Yeah, grab. Should I do it with granulated sugar or, or just put sugar no, syrup I, I, in I, here? I wouldn't do granulated sugar now, actually, because it's already been... Sugar muddled. syrup? So you can try sugar syrup. Yeah. It's in that cupboard there. It's live, people. Live, live yes. Wait, so just a dash or like a spoon equivalent there? Yeah, yeah there, try that. There. And we're stirring and we're... <laughs> Badly. <laughs> so so over over that, so you put your you put your limes in, you put your sugar, whatever variety of sugar you're using, you give that then a damn good muddling. So a really crush it, get all the the lime juice out, get all that sugar dissolved. Chuck some ice in there, give it a nice good stir to get that sort of diluted. Two ounces of the cachaca. Again, another stir. Top it up with more ice. Another stir, and there we have it. All right, let's try it with the extra How's sugar. The extra sugar. Perfect. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Better, better oh now, now I'm getting it. <laughs> now I'm getting it. It was just lime juice. Yeah. I'm sorry. How do? You, how are you finding that though? I, I like that. You like it? I like that. that sharp. Yeah. I like sharp, but that was really. No, sharp. I'm finding that very. Really? I find that fine. Yeah. Ooh, nice. Learned something about you today. <laughs> <laughs> no, that. Maybe, maybe um, I use a more of more of heaped spoons in mine than I did yours. I don't know. Did you just forget to put sugar in mine? Possibly. You say, oh, fuck her. <laughs> so you've got twelve limes in yours. <laughs> know, yeah. Now that is lovely. It's a, it's a it's a Brazilian daiquiri. Yeah. That's exactly it. Oh, I could, I could be on a beach somewhere. Go on, exactly. Could be on a beach. Yeah, imagine sitting on a, <laughs> on a nice beach on, in shade. Obviously, we're not on, on your on your veranda. On the veranda, <laughs> on the magical floating veranda. A few of these, because you could get through a few. Oh of yeah, these, couldn't you? On a hot day, they wouldn't touch the sides. Yeah, and then a few snacks. What snacks would you be having with? I don't this? know. But after a few of these, you might have to walk. I think. You'd know, be having a nap, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you, you're on holiday. You're lying on your veranda on your fabulous, fabulous chaise long, <laughs> which has been brought out to you. You're knocking back a few of these. You've got some... I'm going to go with some fried shrimp. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice yeah. nice seafood. Bit of calamari or something oh, like that. Yeah, yeah that, like that. Knocking that back and then just have a bit of a sleep. And then it's dinner time with more of yeah. these. Let's go on holiday, Nick. Right, so I'm so I'm going to go in there. You you get some fried shrimp on the go. And then we're sorted. I'm going to come in with skips. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> well, with that firmly in hand, I think it's time for us to continue. The continuation. The story of the great train robbery mm, yes indeed so we're back with part two <laughs> so if you haven't yet listened to last week's episode mm-hmm. then do otherwise none of this will make any sense so go back stop now stop <laughs> listen to part one then come back later but i will give you a brief recap in the early hours of the morning 8th of august 1963 16 men from a conglomeration it's a good word of london gangs have stolen over two million pounds <sighs> 2 million 1963 money from a post office train travelling from Glasgow to London. They had tampered with the signals along the track to bring the train to a stop, then stormed the high value package carriage before making off with all the money on the back of a truck. <laughs> they had then holed up at the nearby Leatherslade farm until they realised that the police were getting a bit too close for comfort mm. and they escaped back to London. They knew that their rural hideout was in danger of discovery, so they hired a fixer to torch the place to get rid of any evidence. But uh, they were betrayed. Yes. Betrayed. The arsonist did a bunk with his payment, with his fee. With his fire. With his fire. <laughs> he took all the fire with him. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time the gang had organised for someone else to burn the place down, their worst nightmares had come true. The police were crawling all over it. Uh. And that's where we left it. We did. That was the briefest of recaps, the speediest of recaps. Exactly. You really dragged out episode one, I really didn't you? Did. <laughs> so I got that done in about, what, three minutes? <laughs> but yes, so they'd all been holed up in the farmhouse. Yep. They had been enjoying lovely games of Monopoly. Some lovely Monopoly. <laughs> which was our secret ingredient last week. Everything else had gone, what, a couple of hitches on the way. With the, with the train driver who didn't know how to drive a train. Mm, yeah, yeah, that was less good. That was less good. Yeah, yeah Ronnie Biggs, you had one job. <laughs> All is well. Everyone's divided up the money. Yep. All you need to do is burn the place to the ground. So I'm I'm assuming they cl- but they cleaned the place, didn't they? Well, but they yeah, they sort of rudimentary did a rudimentary cleaning of trying to get rid of fingerprints and all that sort of stuff yes yeah they, they attempted but that's to do. not gonna be you're not gonna get me rid of everything no and and with the but they, and they also had the expectation of well in a day's time this place is gonna be 
a blaze. Fire will cleanse. Fire will cleanse. So mm. perhaps we don't need to do too thorough a job because, yeah, it's going to be on fire, which didn't happen. So while the robbers had been hiding out the farm and then legging it back to London, the police had obviously sprung into action. Sprung? <laughs> sprung into action. <laughs> That's what the police do. And they spring. <laughs> as soon as that phone rings, they spring. They spring, they jump up. <laughs> they leap. Yeah, sorry, wrong number. Shit. I have to recalibrate this now. For... <laughs> Absolutely. So Chief Superintendent Malcolm Futrell from the Buckinghamshire Police Criminal Investigation Department, he arrived on the crime scene at about five o'clock that morning. Yeah, the robbery had taken place at about three-ish. So a couple of hours later, the alert had been sounded and he was he was there. Mm-hmm. He supervised sort of the search of the surrounding areas where the truck had been, obviously where all the tampering of the signals had taken place, the cutting yes. of the wires, did all that. And then he moved on to Cheddington Railway Station, where the actual locomotive had been taken to this sort of a siding, right. yeah. get it out of the way, off the main line. And it was there that statements were being taken from Drack Mills, the driver of the train, yes. and the postal workers who had been sort of tied up and uh, beaten up in the, the high goods carriage. Traumatising for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely indeed. horrible. And injured as well. Yeah, Bad, one, one of them. One, yeah, a couple of them really badly bashed over the head. So in these statements, that it was revealed that the gang had told the men not to move for half an hour. I think we, yes. we covered that in the last week. We now, did. that had suggested to the police that their hideout could be no more than 30 minutes away. So that would have been about 30 miles. So, for, And also from more statements given, that the police knew they were looking for about 15 men, all of whom had been wearing blue boiler suits and masks. Nice. All have had their faces covered. It's really all they've got to go on. Not a lot. Which is not a lot at all, really. Now, it quickly becomes obvious to the chief superintendent that they need more help. They are woefully underprepared and understaffed to mount such a huge investigation and to search such a massive area so they approach scotland yard they call on the london the london bobbies to come and assist <laughs> got there and just been instantly out of my depth <laughs> <laughs> so after a bit of back and forth back and forth about who was going to head up the investigation who had sort of overall jurisdiction oh, and all this sort okay. of like politics who either of... wanted the glory or the blame <laughs> exactly so there was a bit of back and back and forth but eventually the london side of the investigation is put in the hands of the head of the flying squad oh nice at scotland yard now this is detective chief superintendent tommy butler Tommy Butler. Oh, that is a good detective name. It's a good detective name. Feels like he's like a salt of the earth. Absolutely. The flying squad. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah. What is the definition of the flying squad? Okay. Have you got this in here? I have have got this. I have got (laughs) got exactly. I did anticipate (laughs) the querying of the flying squad. Because it yeah, it's something I had heard about, but I did not know what it was, where it really came from, or anything like yeah. that. Well, yes, you sort of nod along, going, oh, yes, the Flying Squad, of course, the Flying Nuns. So, <laughs> so the Flying Squad was a specialist division of Scotland Yard that dealt with robberies. Oh. That is basically what they were. Okay. It had been founded in 1919, so many, many years earlier. Right. And then it was predominantly to gather intelligence on known thieves, robbers, and pickpockets. Okay. It was for them to track Pick down <laughs> these these people in London. Right. They used a horse drawn carriage yeah. with covert holes cut in the sides <laughs> to <laughs> draw up alongside people and spy and listen in to conversations that the robbers might be having and see these pickpocketings in action. <laughs> And then they could leap out of their horse-drawn carriage. <laughs> completely camouflaged. Completely camouflaged. <laughs> um, and make various arrests. And they were hugely successful. Were they? Them, apparently so. This is, so pickpockets are operating this rumbling big horse car. It was just cart. like a normal horse-drawn carriage, of which there were many in the in the 1919s and Covered 1920s. in holes. Um, Covered had in a holes. Little, little hole in there, little eyeball peeking out. Can I commend you on your Elizabethan-esque gesturing of this? And there was an O. Oh, and that. I shall hear, oh my, pressed against it. I'm an actor, don't you know? <laughs> I know there's a lot of horse and cars. There's probably not ones covered in holes with eyes. I'm, that you I'm look thinking at. not like sort of a cheese sort of <laughs> covered covered in holes. <laughs> So. <laughs> there's not even walls it's just them standing there with a tiny bit of wood in it's actually entirely them. made of glass and so i can see everything <laughs> <laughs> it's just a group of men with newspapers with holes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> no they were very covert very discreet and very successful because sure. it was it was founded as a, a very experimental sort of division but their results were so yeah so impressive and so good that it still exists to this to this day this this division um still with a horse and cart still with a horse and cart absolutely <laughs> beware going thieves. around the south circular sort of. 
but where the, where the flying squad bit comes in yes so the, the horses <laughs> it was drawn by pegasus so in the 1920s after the experimental bit had gone this is going quite well we need to establish this as a legitimate permanent sort of division okay um they were given a bunch of um motorcycles and cars that had previously belonged to the royal flying corps Oh, okay. um, which is the predecessor to the RAF. So they just got better vehicles. So yeah, so they they got these they got this batch of vehicles that the Flying Corps didn't need anymore. Right, were, were given to the to Scotland Yard to make use of, and they were all given to Pickpocket Squad because these vehicles came from the Flying Corps. They became known as the Flying Squad. That's rubbish. So yeah, Sorry. <laughs> that's where that's where the name comes from. That's very very interesting. Yeah, that's a really random way of getting the flying squad as a nickname of just they did no flying whatsoever. They didn't. They did no flying. No, there was not a lot of flying around London. No, they um, flew in these vehicles and to also, the this, scene this, of a this crime. Is, this is the twenties sort of things. So they were able to get around the place incredibly quickly. Also, it sucked to be a pickpocket back then really as did. well because you're not you're not raking it in as a pickpocket, surely. No, no. <laughs> someone just taking someone's handkerchief. Uh, I am now back in Dickensian London. Yes, apparently, I think they may be going for more things than handkerchiefs. There's only so much you can carry in your pockets. Well, you need a lot of stuff in your pockets. In the twenties, eh, fancy watches. Right. Fancy watches, lots of jewellery going on. Jewels, just gold. Absolutely, yeah. Everyone carried around gold in the 20s yeah. after the war. Absolutely. Yeah, everyone Very <laughs> fancy. loaded. Very fancy. <laughs> For some kid who just nicks something once, he's mown down by a motorcycle. <laughs> Perhaps that, that one kid wasn't the, the target of the flying squad. No, the guys in the horse and cart have been watching him for years. <laughs> but another thing I didn't realise, they also had the nickname The Sweeney. Is that where that came yeah, from? Yeah, it comes, it comes from there. So The Sweeney, there was... Was a TV show back in the eighties, I think, seventies. Uh, yeah, the, the flying squad was known as the Sweeney because happen? Sweeney Todd Squad Cockney, Cockney rhyming slang. Jesus Christ! It was it was Cockney rhyming slang. Sweeney, Sweeney Todd Sweeney Squad. Todd, squad Cockney. I've never heard of that slang. Not that I'm proficient in. in <laughs> Not that you Cockney know all rhyming Cockney rhyming slang. slang. Fine, I'm on board with it one hundred percent. Well, I'm, I'm now. glad. I'm glad you approve. The history of names. So there everyone. we go. So the flying squad. <laughs> <laughs> so, took up a lot longer than I was planning. You knew I'd have questions. Yeah. Anyway, so Tommy Butler, he is preparing his train squad in London. They have a train now. They oh, have no. the, the squad <laughs> investigating the train in Buckinghamshire. There is a major search going on, um, centering on the crime scene of Brideco Bridge, um, and then fanning out into the countryside. But they're still coming up empty-handed. A watch is put on all the ports in the UK for any signs of anything untoward. Any mm-hmm. people carrying big post bags with them. And the Postmaster General, remember the chap we had oh, before? We don't, how he, can we forget? He makes an appearance again. Now, I still think horse, big hat, probably ginormous moustache. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is now offering £10,000 to the first person giving information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the persons responsible for the robbery. Of his own purse? I can't imagine so, no. No, the Royal Mail going, we have jobs, what? Yes, yeah. so no, he's, he's offering this big old reward for anyone who's going to come forward. Uh, too little, too late, Postmaster mm. General. On the 13th of August, this is five days after the robbery, the police receive a tip. A farmer who works a field adjacent to Leatherslade Farm reports that he has seen men coming and going, vehicles coming and going over the past few weeks. The place had been abandoned for years, which is why he had noticed such goings on. Mm. A sergeant and a constable are dispatched to investigate, and sure enough, the, the farm is deserted, but they find the truck that was used by the gang. <gasps> it's been painted yellow very hastily and badly painted yellow to try and disguise it. Um, not, the, not a smart move in the middle of the smart, countryside. <laughs> no, but the two Land Rovers are there as well uh. that were used as, as getaway vehicles. They also find large quantities of food, Um, still there obviously the the gang had been planning to hang out there a lot longer longer than they did bedding sleeping bags post office sacks empty post office sacks um, empty mail packages banknote wrappers were all left lying around the place they did a shit job of cleaning up. Along with the Monopoly set as well. Oh, the Monopoly set. <laughs> was there. Which is the most damning of all evidence. Yeah. So, I mean, so obviously soon the place is swarming with, with cops. I know mm. this, this is the hideout. And it is clear to them that a, a, an effort has been made to to remove fingerprints. Yes, there's there's food and bedding and all this sort of stuff around the place. A contrast effort has been made to disguise who has been using this stuff. But it's still not that good there's still things have been overlooked there are fingerprints on a ketchup bottle 
there are fingerprints on Monopoly pieces. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Still have fingerprints on that they are able to find. Oh, it's so frustrating. Oh, it's all going to burn. If you're yeah. lazy, it's all It's all going to be in flames. Within hours, it's going to be ablaze. Just burn it when you go. Oh, then, but then you don't want to be nearby, do you? You've got to give it a day or so. Yeah. I mean, despite the discovery of the farm, the investigation is still not going particularly well. They still have no idea who or where any of these men are. This is the 60s, so there, there is no just chucking fingerprints into a computer yeah. and it's spitting out a, a match of a, from a global database or anything like that. They've got the fingerprints, but they need something to compare them to. They need people to compare the fingerprints to, so they still... Oh, shit. We're still a bit stuck. So the the real breakthrough comes when Detective Chief Superintendent Millen, now he's a senior bod at Scotland Yard, he meets an unnamed distinguished barrister. He's described that as a right. distinguished barrister. Oh, the lawyer. No, d- n- diff- no, different, different, different. N- not, not the, okay. not, not, not the, person we've not, been dealing not with Brian before. Field, who we dealt with before. New, okay, a distinguished, this, a distinguished barrister. barrister. Now, this is in a the smoking room of a very exclusive London club. Okay, it's very, very fancy, very, very, very fancy. fancy, very white privilege. It's grand. Mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, the barrister tells Millen that someone has approached him and is willing to give names. He's willing to name names of the gang members involved in the robbery. Now, this new informant who is actually never identified in the official records. Hmm. But many people actually meet him over over these weeks and get his statements. He has been recently sent to prison, just before the robbery. He had known all about it. He was in on the planning, or he knew people who were. And he is willing to give up names for a reduced sentence... And for a few perks while he is while he's inside. Sure, fair enough. He's willing to do that. Now it is perfect timing for for the case. Um, Millen later wrote in his book, um, "Specialist in Crime," that the breakthrough with the informer came at a moment when I and my colleagues at the yard were in a state of frustration, almost approaching despair. Ooh. So they really they had fuck all to go on, and then this <laughs> informer comes along and says, "Yeah, I'll give you a big old list of names." if you knock some years off my my sentence. And they make an arrangement. They make an agreement. And they're all patting themselves on the back going, we did a splendid job there. How marvellous we are. We're (laughs) wonderful. We've cracked the case, boys. Yeah. So through this informer, they gather a list of 18 names who were supposed to have been involved somehow in the robbery. Now, this list is distributed to the detectives of the Flying Squad, to Tommy's boys as they became known. Mm. Many of the names were known criminals. They now had names that they could check fingerprints found at Leatherslade Farm against. They just had to actually find these men. Mm-hmm. They had to go and track down these men. And DCSI Millen did something incredibly unhelpful. Though it boosted his public profile considerably, um, against the protests of Tommy Butler of the Flying Squad, Millen releases the names and photographs of the wanted men to the press. What? So the robbers, who were generally feeling fairly confident about they haven't got a clue who we are, now know that they are hunted men, that they are wanted men, and instantly go to ground. Wow. But that, that would prejudice any jury. There's all sorts of, yes, legal shenanigans <laughs> going on there. But also, yeah, they're going to run away. Yeah, they're they're going to scatter. Scatter. Yeah. Maybe that does bring out more people who are going to go, ooh, money, reward, my mate. I'm yeah. going to turn him in. I think, I think, I don't know if Millen does it purely for the public recognition that he is he has released his names he's got this list um, of wanted men is it going to help his career further his yeah his personal aims or is it so well people are going to come forward and say oh i've seen him down the shops or something mm, not quite sure there's so many of them you'd think that some people would go oh actually yeah i didn't know yeah him. yeah if it so, was one person you'd have no chance yeah now so butler now has a job of tracking down these men um who knew that they were being chased down He's only recently taken over command of the Flying Squad, but he was exactly what the team needed. He had been given various nicknames during his career. Um, One Day Tommy was one of his nicknames. (laughs) For the speed in which he tracked down criminals, that was one. Uh, The Grey Fox, for his his shrewd and cunning plans. That's good. He he was known as. He He was one of Scotland Yard's best. He was fanatically devoted to to his job to yeah. solving crimes he never married he lived at home with his mother he worked all the hours god sent and he expected 
all the members of the team to do exactly the same. He was married to the job. He was married to the job. There was no time for going home. Wives, families, fuck that. (laughs) Job comes first. And you are... (laughs) I'm also thinking, what a hero, and gay. And (laughs) And so he he is not that popular. Well, he organises the the six-man train robbery squad onto a rotor where there are there are always men on duty 24 hours a day there are people on duty so no matter when a new piece of information comes in something breaks there are people there day or night who can jump on it and do whatever they need to do hmm. now when the squad tried to get him to ease working conditions slightly i said oh, i haven't seen my children in three weeks <laughs> <laughs> um, but butler goes into an absolute rage he threatens to send them back to their their previous jobs as like just like squaddies or whatever like that he is not having it you put in this comes first this comes first what need you of children and family children and family and love and happiness and friendship (laughs) and all this sort of stuff no you're captain i've had to give up love for my job and (laughs) so shall you Mm. oh that is a bit of man that is that is a man who is not allowed to do what he likes well he also has a reputation for being incredibly secretive as well he does not trust those under his command often squad members were dispatched on tasks having no idea how what they were doing fit into the the, the investigation as, as a whole it's only later when they came back with an answer or something it became obvious why they had to do Ooh. it one of the squad a chap called jack slipper um who wrote in his book <laughs> his book called slipper of the yard which is a book i'd actually heard of i've never read it but I've, i'd heard That's the great name heard of the slipper of the yard he wrote that he wouldn't even tell his left hand what the right one was doing. <laughs> great phrase. So, which is great. Yeah. It's just for being so unbelievably closed and, and secretive. Clearly very good at his But in very job? good at the job. Incredibly good at the so job. So either had a man with secrets of his own or was a really toxic boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was the best boss to work for. Well, but, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, I'd like to speak to my union member. Work-life balance? Uh, <laughs> no. No, I need a personal day. The fuck you will. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Now, the, the first gang member to actually be caught <gasps> was Roger Cordry. Now, he was the, the leader of the South Coast Raiders, the, the yes. gang who had been brought in <laughs> for their train-robbing expertise. He had been lying low with a friend of his, William Bowl, in a flat above a florist in Bournemouth. Oh, nice. <laughs> Police had been tipped off to their location by Ethel Clark. Now, Ethel, <laughs> was a sh- Ethel was a shrewd woman. She is the widow of a police officer. Mm. She knows to ask questions. And when Roger and William paid her three months rent in advance for a ne- <laughs> for a nearby garage all in crumpled 10 shilling notes she, she knows, thought ah yeah. oh, something's dodgy here something no. something's wrong yeah and she reports it to her husband's old colleagues the police take roger and william in for questioning and roger's link to the robbery is quickly established he's mm. one of the names on the list from the informer william bowl who was just helping his mate out nothing whatsoever to do with the robbery is also arrested as Aging being part betting, of the, yeah. the train gang. Yeah. Um, he is sentenced to 24 years in prison. Wow. Oh. For his part in the train robbery, which he d- had nothing to do with. Well, well, um, he, he hid his mate. He hid his mate. He hid his mate. This is this is true. But that's a deterrent, isn't it? Is that if you give anyone shelter... You well, are... no, he, he he was charged with being part of the gang who robbed the train. He wasn't charged as a yeah as an accomplice or no, but that's what I mean. Hiding it's, anyone, he was charged I'm sure with that. they knew yeah. that he wasn't. But it's to say to anyone else that is a sign out there. If you give anyone sanctuary, like sorry, we're in Notre Dame apparently. But <laughs> if you do if you do shelter anyone, if you do give them an alibi, you are complicit. Anyone else who was hiding any of the criminals, I could get 24 years for this. Not just a slap on the wrist. What I'm gonna life in prison get the hell out of my shed he actually ends up dying in prison oh Um, and police do years later acknowledge that he had been a victim of a miscarriage of justice yeah because he had been charged yes it was actually being part of the 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 train gang and not just yeah hiding someone which would have been a a much less severe sentence they admitted yeah right we fucked up on on that one yeah it does it does Uh, feel like they use that to their advantage i'm I'm just making an assumption there maybe they absolutely did mess up and they thought (laughs) no you were the you were driving the train and the man was like i have no hands and Mm. what now other arrests soon followed as tommy butler and his flying squad (laughs) well they put enormous pressure on friends and family to give up those who are in hiding Gordon Goody, Charlie Wilson, Roy James, John Daly, Roger Cordry, which is spoken about, yeah. um, Bob Welch, Tommy Wisby, Jim Hussey, and Ronnie Biggs are all arrested and sent to trial for the robbery. 
the purchase of Leatherslade Farm, their hideout, had been tracked back to Brian Fields, the solicitor's clerk, yes. who was the linchpin and had connected various people together. Mm, I think so. He had used his own firm, though, to act as a conveyancer for the purchase. So when this was traced back through legal records, it's like, you own the farm. You own the hideout. Oh, dear. You bought it through your own solicitor's practice. In addition to this... Now, this this is a weird one. On Friday the 16th of August, a couple taking... My birthday. It is your birthday. A few years before you were born. One or two. <laughs> what couple... year is this? 1963. When my mother was 23. <laughs> Hang on, was she 23? No, she no. was 13. No, she was... <laughs> so, sorry, so, I was so, like... So, she wasn't born how, in the 40s. How old am I? <laughs> right. My dad was 24. My mother was 13. That makes it sound weird. Sorry. Yeah. No, they met many years later. <laughs> <laughs> I glinted my daddy's eye, I was. But this couple were taking a stroll through Dorking Woods. Dorking? <laughs> right, okay. Lovely why? woods around Dorking. Why are, you, why are you putting so much emphasis on Dorking no, that's, that's, that's where they were. Um, and <laughs> okay. while, while strolling, they discovered a hold all. Oh. And then a briefcase. And then a camel skin bag. All full of cash. But they just dotted out just, like a gingerbread well, sort of trail. <laughs> I'm not sure. They, That's weird. They called the police about their discovery. I would have just run off with the money, personally. No, you wouldn't. Uh, ooh, ooh. Or I would have nabbed a few 50s. <laughs> we need to come back to this because... <laughs> That's showing a lot about mm. you immediately. What would you do if you found a hold all full of money in the woods? Oh, that's a big... Yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to that in okay, a minute. That's, that's so they, they call the police and the police search a bit more and they find yet another briefcase stashed, stuffed full of cash. The total found was around £100,000 in 63 money. So a huge quantity of money. But the money is not the only thing in the bags. In one of them, the police find a receipt from a hotel in the German town of Bad Hindelang. Oh, okay. What? It's just a German, German Stop town. laughing, everyone. From a, from a hotel. But the receipt is made out to Herr and Frau Field. What? So Brian Field Brian is, Fields, is the yeah. sister. So there is a receipt saying this is his bag. This is his bag, but he's just left all this... And left all the money around. They have the police contacts at Interpol quickly confirmed. Yeah, Brian and Karen, his wife, had be, indeed stayed at this hotel earlier that year. Yes, they definitely belong to this chap. Now I, get conf- I got confused about why the money was in the woods. Yes. So I looked at a couple of reports. One seemed to suggest that it had, it had just been dumped there. Someone trying to get rid of it. Things were Perhaps things were getting too too hot. They just want to get, the, get rid of the money so it wasn't found on them. Another report indicated that the bags were almost hidden. So was it someone who had hidden them there, thinking, okay, when things calm down, I will mm. come back and retrieve it later? If so, they did a shit job at hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> Put it one leaf on top of them. <laughs> so, and no one will ever know. So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure as to why the bags were in the woods. It's strange, isn't it? Which is, I, find, couple... I found a bit odd, that they were just sort of left there for people to find. If you're hiking in the woods... Dorking, Dor- I don't know Dorking Woods. Do you well. not? Perhaps no. we should go for your birthday. Uh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a large woodland area, and if it's not on a path, if you do go hiking through the woods, you go off the path and yeah. you're sort of trekking around. You find we. Uh, I found weird shit in the woods. I found weird stuff. So perhaps, yeah, perhaps they were. So maybe it was there, sort of like no one's going to wander by. No here, one's going to wander by there. But just so happened, someone did. Very or, possibly. That couple was doing some weird stuff and they didn't want the police to know about it. And then they went, <laughs> and while we were rolling around in our furry outfits, <laughs> um, we found all this money. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I, don't, I don't know. That's interesting. But Brian Field was arrested ah. on the 15th of September and sent to trial with his co-conspirators. Yeah. And I don't think it's time for a wee drink. I think it is. I need more caipirinis. More, more caipirinis for you. woo Okay, Nick, we have our drinks. You do. Now I've mastered the mix of it. Master the mix. This one, bang on. Let me try your one. Yeah, yeah, well, go for it, go for it. It might be a bit too sweet for you, I'm not sure. It's very nice. I would say, yeah, a little wee bit, wee bit sweet, but it, very nice. I can taste more of the spirit in yeah. there with the lime without it being too much. <laughs> you know. <laughs> on with the stories. On with the story, and then the moral dilemma, which I'm going to come back to later. Okay. Yeah. So, the trial. Trial. The trial began at... Aylesbury on the 20th of January in 1964. Now, the normal courtroom they had there is deemed too small for the volume of defendants and lawyers and journalists present. So the district council offices are converted to hold the event. Okay. Because the courtroom is just too tiny. <laughs> the trial lasts 51 days. Wow. Includes 613 
exhibits, bits of evidence, and 240 different witness statements. I think that's quite short, So, actually. yeah, there's 11 defendants. 51 days for 11 Fif- defendants? 51 days. The jury re- then retire to determine their verdict. Guilty. <gasps> guilty! So, very, very guilty. Saying that, one of them, John Daly, is actually acquitted without any charge. Oh, nice. On there, because his lawyer has managed to, managed to get him off on a really weird excuse that his his fingerprints were only found on the Monopoly set. And he managed to convince people that he had actually played the Monopoly with his brother-in-law, Bruce Reynolds, the mastermind behind it. Yes. Months, months earlier at Bruce's house. Okay. <laughs> So That's... he has nothing to do with it, but he's my brother-in-law. I was around there. We had a game of Monopoly. That's why my fingerprints are on the Monopoly set. You can't prove anything else. Oh. So he he was he was acquitted. Bollocks, he was there. No. But he was he was he, he he managed to get away with it. Just rolling out of that council yeah. office. <laughs> Everyone else, you're all fucking guilty. It doesn't have the same gravitas if they were doing it in the council offices. You know, you can walk out of court because courts usually like big, grand, sort yeah. of hallowed places. Imposing you're just walking out, bumping into someone's desk while they're still filing receipts. <laughs> Mr. Justice Davies, the, the judge. Um, describes the robbery as a crime of sordid violence inspired by vast greed. Ooh, nice, nice, nice. And then he issues his sentence. Okay. Seven of the defendants are given 30 years in prison for their part in the robbery. Mm. Um, Brian Field, the, the solicitor's clerk, is given 25 years because he wasn't there at the robbery he was no. just involved in the planning and the plotting and the scheming and all that sort of stuff <laughs> all um, of the stuff that made it work yeah um say so william bowl the the chap who hid his friend given 24 years not ideal after appeal some of the sentences are reduced but yeah. even then they are still seen at the time as incredibly harsh well incredibly severe for for the the crime no one was killed yes there was violence people were beaten around the head they were knocked unconscious which is a, a, a terrible, terrible it's a, a thing. Terrible, yes. But it, the, the, the the sentences were seen at the time as very, very harsh. The other gang members who were arrested in later years and tried by different judges were given much more lenient hmm. sentences. It does seem like a lot of it is deterrent, deterrent, deterrent. Mm. Yes, don't you dare try and take our mo- the, the the country's and money. And also because it was a crime that really there had never been anything like it. No. Uh, to that that extent, that level, that m- amount of money <laughs> had had never been nicked before. So they were just sort of free. So they were like, going, oh, this has never happened before. <laughs> Let, yeah, know. we need to make an example of these people who have done this this crazy massive thing. Yeah, uh, we need to make it sound big. Um, Don't do the crime if you can't do well, the time. True enough. Which is ironic, because <laughs> did they? Mm. But I say, what are those who had not yet been brought to justice? There were say there were eleven there. One of whom has been acquitted. Ten incarcerated there are still a number of people that are still at large oh yeah who two of the main men behind the plan bruce reynolds and buster edwards mm. they're still free they're still out there somewhere oh, jimmy yeah. white one of the southwest gang members what the snooker player a different one i feel okay he had also completely vanished to become a snooker player. to become a <laughs> snooker player <laughs> he had retrained entirely <laughs> Now, Bruce Reynolds, say he had been the, really the mastermind, he had planned yes. the whole thing. He managed to evade the authorities for long enough to arrange his escape from the country. Mm. He hid for six months in a house in South Kensington, waiting for a false passport. Then in June 1964, he assumed the name of Keith Clement Miller um, nice. may, and made his way to Belgium. From Belgium, he flew to Toronto from Toronto on to Mexico City. His wife and son joined him a few months later. Mm. That Christmas, Buster Edwards and his family managed to get out of the UK and they joined them in Acapulco. Yes. Uh, margaritas <laughs> around the pool. <laughs> a delightful way to spend your retirement <laughs> in good old Mexico. And this is now flashing back still. I referenced it in episode one. The film, Buster, with Phil Collins in yeah. it. But it shows how the, the lads were all fine with Mexico, but the wives, oh, how they missed Blighty. Mm. They didn't like, and there was a whole bit about they didn't like margarita because they had salt round the rim. And it's like, well, I'm going back to my room to have some fish and chips. And it's like, 
Fuck off. Anyone who was <laughs> over there would be like, it's Mexico. There's sea, there's booze. You well, liars. No, I don't know. Because, I mean, Buster Edward, firstly, he starts to run out of money. His family grow very homesick. His wife really wants to go home really wants to return so that actually happened yeah, that absolutely because the happened. way it was done in the film was not not well yeah so no re- she, they absolutely she, she wants to return to to the uk not realizing that if they do then her husband is fucked you're in mexico you know what you want drizzle because <laughs> they couldn't live without in 1966 he actually contacts the uk yeah. authorities and he negotiates his return to the uk he is arrested on his arrival he did and he is sentenced to 15 years in prison say a much more lenient sentence though those who hadn't fled the country giving himself up and know, give, like yeah but he gave himself up he yeah, negotiated yeah. 15 years he spends nine years in prison before he's released in 1975 quite famously goes on to run a flower stall outside waterloo station oh he does he does <laughs> so, he does and he becomes quite the, the tourist attraction really and then as you say phil collin plays him in a film <laughs> He has reached peak, <laughs> peak criminal. <laughs> I'm only going on about this because my mom was for some reason obsessed with that film <laughs> and kept saying, I'll take you to meet Buster. I'm, I've, never, I've never seen it, I must admit. <laughs> I've seen it way too many times. <laughs> I know the fact that in the film, when he comes back to England, he has one more night with his wife and then he gets arrested. That's in my memory. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> yes, there's other things that I could do with knowing. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Back in the UK, <laughs> the men who had been caught, they are now stewing in prison. And some of them are determined to do something about it. Not really too happy about being in prison. Yes. On the 12th of August, 1964... Almost my birthday again. Almost your birthday again. Charlie Wilson escapes Winston Green Prison in Birmingham. He, he gets out in under three minutes, which is a speedy escape. Three men break into the prison to get him out. Now, no one has seen anything like this before. No. Um, prisons are designed to stop people getting out. Not No one's really considered that people can try and break in. <laughs> so, How do they do it? Uh, I, I don't know the details. Okay, good. I because now I, I can, now I yeah, can make I, sure. I, I, I didn't look up the, the exact details. <laughs> just be um, running, screaming into the well, building. Well, one would assume with that they... cars and just axes. But they, they got into the building. They managed to get <laughs> Charlie Wilson and get him out in under three minutes. Wardens and security be going, what the fuck? <laughs> You're going the wrong way. You, you've come in. You're meant to know. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay because the doors don't open outwards. Oh shit, they open inwards. <laughs> very, very complicated. The, the the escape team, the three men who formed this escape team, team. Um, who, was, who was led by a, a man who was nicknamed Frenchy. <laughs> nice. No idea if he was French or not, but they were never caught. They were never apprehended. No, <laughs> never knew who they were. Um, Frenchy, he disappeared from the, L- the London criminal networks in sort of late sixties. He was never heard of again. Um, I'm just now picturing him as a mime. <laughs> 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 Perhaps perhaps that's how he got a. He he was a distraction for the guards. (laughs) He walks past him like, oh, how entertaining, how lovely. (laughs) Who is mine day at Winsome Prison? (laughs) Beating a guard to the ground with a garland of onions. That's exactly how it happened. Dazzled them with his baguettes. (laughs) And never seen of again. There we are. Never seen of again. Charlie Wilson makes his way to Mexico. And he is soon knocking back tequila with his old friends, Bruce Reynolds and Buster Edwards. So yeah. they're having a grand old reunion in Mexico City. Nice. Now, Wilson, he actually, eventually he goes to Canada. He settles just outside of Montreal. Oh, lovely. Just Ooh, there. Good choice. Good under choice. the name of Ronald Alloway. He settles there. He is a most respectable member of the community. He joins the golf club. And all things, um, those around him are obviously completely unaware of his criminal background. He's just dear old lovely Ronald. It is only when he invites his brother-in-law over to the UK for Christmas that Scotland Yard go, <laughs> So see, they have still got his family oh, members and what have yeah. you under surveillance. They So they see that this random chap in Canada has invited his brother-in-law to come over and stay. Yeah. And they go, ooh. This this is our man. So there's a uh, legal uh, arrangements to, to get to be extradited from Canada. Now they actually they they wait three months before making their move. They have him under surveillance. Um, Tommy Tommy actually goes out there and he's got them under surveillance in the hope that Wilson is going to lead them to Bruce Reynolds. 
So Bruce, he's nice. he is still okay. out there somewhere. They don't know where he is. Buster Edwards is, is now in prison. Yeah. They've got Charlie Wilson under surveillance. Bruce Reynolds, he is the last one that they know about who is on the list. So I think, okay, is Charlie going to lead us to this, the criminal mastermind here? Mm. No, he doesn't. So eventually they go, fine, he is arrested on the 25th of January, 1968 by Tommy Butler who manages to get him. Charlie never gives up his friend, Bruce Reynolds. He never says where he is. He has promises of, we'll reduce your sentence, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. No, he remains stum. Does not say a thing. So Bruce has been living up in Mexico. Now he is starting to realise that he is getting through a lot of cash. He is living, but he's living quite a fancy life. He's living a bit of a high Isn't the high life. always the way? Well, but it, things are running out. After Buster Edwards has left Mexico, returned to the UK, Bruce decides that, well, perhaps it's time for a change for him as well. And in December of 66, he moves to Montreal. He moves up to where Charlie Wilson is in Canada. <laughs> but then realises the potential danger of having them two of them so close to each other. Yeah. So he then moves across to Vancouver. He starts off life there, but not really liking that ends up in France, moves to Nice Mm. in France. Eventually, his need for money becomes so acute that he and his wife, they're forced to return to the UK. He's thinking, I can get work there. I can perhaps get some of my old contacts. So they end up settling in Torquay um, under the name of Keith Hiller down in Devon. Okay. But on a visit to London to try and reconnect with some of his gangland chums, Reynolds is recognised by officers of the Metropolitan Police. He is arrested Foolish. in Torquay on the 9th of November, 68. He is offered a deal by prosecutors, plead guilty, and we won't pursue your wife and son on criminal charges. Your wife and son who fled the country to go yeah. to Mexico, who are complicit, who have made use of the money that you gain through criminal activities, we won't go after them for criminal charges if you plead guilty. Mm. And he agrees. He says, yes, Fair. he does oh, okay. that yeah, to save his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for him. And ish. he ish. <laughs> ish. <laughs> <laughs> he is sentenced to 25 years. Lastly, we have we come to Ronnie Biggs. Mm. Dear old Ronnie Biggs. One of the most famous. Yeah. And he's the most famous. And he completely messed up his job. <laughs> he's the most famous for doing the most fuck all. But the but most famous for being spending 36 years on the run. For the most audacious and the most successful. For the mo- yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It is Ronnie Biggs. Now, Ronnie, was he was one of the first ones rounded up back in 1964. Mm, he had yeah, was sentenced to, to 30 years. He served 15 months of this 30-year sentence before scaling the 30-foot walls of Wandsworth Prison yeah. on a rope ladder <laughs> <laughs> and then dropping onto a waiting removals van that had been parked at the other side of the wall. The escape, the whole escape plan had been put together by a recently released prisoner, a chap called Paul Seaborn, with the assistance of various other ex-convicts. Ronnie Leslie and uh, Ronnie Black yeah. were there. And also support from Biggs' wife, Charmaine. She mm. was in on it, trying to organise this escape from the outside. Mm. So the plot involved two other prisoners sort of running interference with the, the guards and the wardens on the inside so they they were they were paid off they knew they weren't escaping yeah. they just had to make a fucking nuisance of themselves dancing yeah which they did well just and doing card tricks for ages this allows biggs and a friend of his eric flower to escape over the wall two other prisoners also try and take advantage of this confusion yeah. and this 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 craziness and the rope ladder that's hanging down the wall <laughs> they their venture is not quite as successful. They are they are recaptured within a couple of months. But Biggs, he has got a long. There's a there's a plan in place to get Biggs sorted and out of the country. I think it's, that's probably why he's got one of the most famous reputations of the audacity of his escape. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. All the stuff you see on TV and film is like Ronnie Biggs is one of the models for it <laughs> because you're like, oh shit, he yeah. did it. Yeah. He did it, and it was so incredibly well thought out and well funded Very as well. well planned, it yeah. cost him a huge amount of money, and there, but there was provision of this to, for him to be smuggled out of the country, mm. and he ended up in Paris going across to France. Now, while in France, he acquired new identity papers mm. and underwent plastic surgery. To change his appearance. (laughs) Why have I got fake boobs? (laughs) We'll try again. The face. The face. The face. I need to look different. (laughs) Don't put breasts there. (laughs) You made my breasts bigger and my dick smaller. Uh, Why? No, no, no. Not the way I wanted. (laughs) In 66, he flees to Sydney. Yes. Goes from France oh, to Sydney. First, oh. Yeah, he goes to Sydney. Yeah. He lives there for a few months before settling in settling in Adelaide. Adelaide, lovely place. But escaping the law doesn't come cheap. 
Yeah. So he had a healthy payout. He for, he got the one of the the big portions, one hundred forty seven thousand pounds from his part in the robbery. Mm. He's got only seven grand left yeah. by this point. Um, he has paid forty thousand pounds for his plastic surgery. That is forty thousand pounds, nineteen sixty three money. Jesus, that is around eight hundred thousand <laughs> pounds. What did on he have? plastic surgery. What? I mean, and I've seen pictures of yeah. Ronnie Biggs. What the hell did he have done? He for that his, much money? He had his dick done. <laughs> Very possibly. <laughs> he basically went in and just said, like, do a bit around the eyes, dye my yeah. hair, and while we're here, mate, you know. I want three penises. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I suppose you're paying a premium when you're doing it to sort of under the counter. Yes, you're not literally um, going into a thing going, what's your name? My name is Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> everything's going to cost more absolutely and he does it costs him a huge amount he pays fifty five thousand for his prison break mm. the prison break the worth it the, the trip the, <laughs> the move to, to paris the new identity papers and then the the trip to australia uh-huh. fifty five thousand nineteen sixty three 1963 money so yeah worth it mm. huge amount of money he's free he but he's free absolutely he's left with seven grand now money is disappearing fast he takes on work as a builder to mm. support his family but then in 1967 just after their third child is born in adelaide he receives an anonymous letter from the uk telling them that Interpol suspect that he is in Australia. He has to move. Yeah. They know where you are. In May that year, they move to Melbourne, where he works in set construction at the, the Channel 9 Television City Studios. Love it. So he's there <laughs> um, building sets. In October 1969, a newspaper report reveals that wanted fugitive Ronnie Biggs is living in Melbourne. Oh, shit. He is there. And the claims that the, the police are closing in on him now this story leads the evening bulletins yeah. the evening news and biggs is going fuck <laughs> <laughs> he's there building the yeah. set while it's on the news going uh <laughs> shit that's that's me i need to get out of there it was like sharing pictures and everyone's looking at him going our builder over there with a the fantastic breast <laughs> he looks a little bit a like him disturbing bulge in his trousers <laughs> what's going on there <laughs> he flees melbourne he legs it he stays with uh, family friends f- going from place to place until five months later he finds himself with a doctored passport boarding a passenger liner bound for panama Within two weeks of his arrival in Panama, he has flown to Brazil. Hey, hey, we got we, there. <laughs> we got. We all knew. We knew where it was some going. Some of us knew. That big lumbering plane towards Brazil. Yeah, we got yeah. there eventually. Now he likes Brazil. Yeah. Brazil has no extradition treaty with the Ew. UK. He is there. He is safe. He can do what the fuck he likes. Mm. No one is going to get him. Now, in the meantime, his wife and sons, who are still in Melbourne, they are tracked down there. There's nothing the police can do about it. They know exactly where Ronnie is, but they can do fuck all about it. The Brazilian authorities will not extradite to the UK. There is there is no agreement there, so it's not going to happen. Charmaine refuses to follow her husband. As far as he's concerned, he abandoned them in Melbourne. So he she and the sons have followed him around the world. As soon as his name came up in Melbourne, he fucked off and left them behind. Yeah. So she's like, right, nah none of this i'm not going um i will stay in melbourne <laughs> so i'm quite happy a nice life there. and eventually yeah, yeah, yeah. she returns to the uk when biggs finds out that charmaine is not coming to join him he starts a relationship with a, a nightclub dancer in brazil uh, raimunda de castro this woman's name and the pair go on to have a son which gives him even more security in mm. brazil because the law brazilian law at the time does not allow for a parent of a brazilian child to be extradited at all so even if Brazilian authorities wanted to get rid of him now they can't because he has got a legitimate link to be there Mm. one restriction he does have though is as a known criminal he can't work he can't work exactly he can't work he's not allowed to visit bars and he has has to be home by 10 in the evening to provide himself with an income he starts hosting barbecues (laughs) at his at his home in Rio tourists could for the fee have a drink with Ronnie Biggs. Ronnie would regale them about <laughs> the great train driver. Probably neglecting the tiny, tiny part of it. And the bit he did have, he fucked up by getting a train driver who couldn't drive trains. Uh, <laughs> but here was the great Ronnie Biggs. Part holding of the great, court. Yeah, holding court. Famous, the, a known criminal Absolutely. On the, the only one of the great train gang who was still free and evading, mm. the, evading the authorities. He was here. <laughs> come, and, come and have a drink. You can also pick up Ronnie Biggs mugs. T-shirts <laughs> for all your mates back home. Bit of merch. That's what you need. In March 1981, 
Biggs, he's kidnapped by a gang of Brit- ex-British shol- soldiers. <laughs> the boat that they smuggle him out of Brazil on <laughs> then has mechanical problems and, and breaks down <laughs> off the coast of Barbados and has to be rescued by the Barbados Coast Guard. They're dragged back to land and then they realise, well, Barbados has, has no extradition treaty with the UK no. either. So, <laughs> so the soldiers are there trying to get a reward for that for, for capturing wanted fugitive ronnie biggs ronnie biggs just like living up and at then the, bar, the like, sort of the barbadian uh, authorities are sending him back to brazil yeah like going, oh, you go back to brazil. <laughs> soldiers fuck off what the hell are you playing at see these soldiers as well i remember reading about that um they're not were they just regular soldiers they weren't i mean they they clearly weren't it says they're, they're, they're ex or... they're ex soldiers the ex soldiers gang, gang for hire type the, yeah, uh, not SAS or SBS because no. otherwise he would be in England if that yeah. happened. That just seems like a bunch of squaddies. Yeah, it's, it's, got a, it's a, a bunch drunk, of squaddies. Yeah, got a shit Thinking boat. We can do this. Yeah, <laughs> these, these these are not the elite of the the, the British <laughs> Army or a sort of who'd yeah, done any, any research yeah. whatsoever or sort of any sort of official capacity. Have they have they done any of this? <laughs> Eventually, in May two thousand and one. Age yes. 71. Mm. After having suffered three strokes in Brazil, Ronnie Biggs voluntarily decides to return to England. He knows that he could be and probably will be arrested the moment he steps back on English soil. But he says that before he dies, he wants to walk into a Margate pub as an Englishman and buy a pint of bitter. <laughs> You love that, don't yeah, you? Absolutely. Being Good a old, Thanet boy. Absolutely. Being a Margate boy. I don't know if he ever got to. Though. I don't know if it, no, I don't know if he did. Because he was honest. very ill when he, he was, got back. Yeah, I mean, he was arrested as soon as he landed back. Do you remember it? Vaguely. I remember watching it on I TV. Remember, I remember being on TV. I, I remember not paying a huge mm. amount of uh, notice at the time, really. So I remember watching it. Everyone tuned in. Oh, yeah. So it was a big thing. It was, like, it, it was a massive thing, absolutely. Mm. Now, he is sent back to prison in his yep. 70s. In his 70s. To serve the remainder of his 30-year sentence that he had served 15 <laughs> months of. So he's got a little left to go. They, uh, in fact. Yeah, yes. he is eventually released on the 6th of August, 2009. Mm. Two days before his 80th birthday on Compassionate Grounds. He's not a well man by this mm. point. He eventually goes on to die on the 18th of September, 2013 aged 84 he's got a good four years yeah he's had a good four years on the outside absolutely and completely not well not well but living off fantastic notoriety oh my god and having a grand old time giving interviews writing books being (laughs) sort of consultants on films and everything and having a bloody marvellous time with it and why the hell wouldn't you (laughs) down in Margate down in Margate having a a pint of bitter absolutely (laughs) so there we have it I mean the mysterious Ulsterman the, this supposedly post office chap who came up with the whole thing originally, no idea, no idea who this ever was. Old Pete, the hapless train driver oh, who couldn't Pete. drive trains, no idea. He just slinked off. Whatever like, happened to him, no one ever man. knew what happened to him. <laughs> of the two point six million pounds that was stolen, they only ever got back four hundred thousand. Yeah. The rest of it. <laughs> Spent on living life to the full, passed on to friends and family when other, they all went into prison and stuff like that. There yeah. are reports of money being hidden under floorboards and in, in panels <laughs> in old houses and stuff like that. And that is the story. And that is the story of the great train robbery. Love it. Marvellous. Oh, yay, Nick. Definitely worth a two-parter. Definitely. Definitely. Definitely, Absolutely brilliant. Such a good story and such an interesting story of a heist in that era as well. Mm. In England, any of our English listeners or European listeners possibly, it's got such sort of nostalgic folklore about it. And I use those words very carefully. It's that sort of 60s criminal. It's Mm. it's got that sort of almost sort of like Michael Caine sort of Italian job sort of vibe thing going on there. (laughs) Yeah, Complete criminals, Come absolutely. Complete. Take, take whatever you can. Didn't kill anyone. But Didn't just kill anyone. Like, oh, Didn't yeah, carry well, guns and things. But yeah, career those, criminals. and Those cheeky chaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah just managed <laughs> to knock off a, a train. Never happened before. D- don't don't rob people. Yeah. Don't don't commit <laughs> crimes. They had their comeuppance sort of. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, did it all, they all did in the end. Some of them had more jolly time than others. Oh, it's a great it's a great story and a great heist. Mm, yes. So my moral question to okay. you, Nick, you're in the woods. Apparently I failed already. No, I don't know. I'm interested. You're in the woods and yeah. you do find two or three like a substantial amount yeah. of cash. Low denomination. 
in bags. Your instant thing was don't call the police <laughs> or take a few 50s, stuff them somewhere. You, you'd have to call the police. If it was uh, like bags of money, you'd have to. You can't take the whole lot. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I would. I probably wouldn't. I'd be too scared. But sorely tempted to skim a bit off the top. <laughs> Just go to the pub. How much? I don't know. Take under, if they, I don't know. Hundred quid. There. Take, quid? Take hundred quid. Go and buy something yeah. nice. Because that's, that's the thing with the police check if they turned up. So, or I is it know. anonymous tip off or something? Or you no, you, well, you, then, I don't know. Then that that seems more dodgy. That um, instantly, I'd have the paranoia. Oh, but massively. It's not about the police. I think I'd be. I was being watched. So. If if there is a big bag of money there, <laughs> someone wants that money. Someone's keeping an eye on it, maybe in the trees. Maybe there's a fox that has done well for itself. Yeah, yeah maybe so. Um, no, I'd be walking away from that going, <laughs> absolutely not. Would you call the police? Yes. Right. Out of the woods. As, once you got out. Far out of once the woods. I didn't see that. Clock the location, get out, call the police. No, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Yeah. I love you were immediately yeah. back and just rifling uh, through I, it. I probably, yeah. <laughs> I think I think if I was there in the time, I'd probably be too scared. I know there's some people who would be like, if they saw a 20 on the ground, they would go, oh, did anyone drop a 20? Oh, no, fuck that. Unless it's obvious who dropped it. Yes. If you're in a crowded place and someone drops it, you know, yeah. give it back or anything. But if, if it's, you just, it's, it's just there, fine. then no, I'm having it. You know, the people who go to the police station hand yeah. in 20 pounds. You're like, yeah. oh, I found, so I found I found 20 pound note on the floor once. On the pavement. Was it yours? No, no, no. Just walking down the street, and there was. Oh, nice. Yeah, someone, someone had dropped it. Did you it. report it? No. <gasps> Thief. Yeah. There was no one in sight. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I remember that. Was and it I in did. a big bag of money it that wasn't, you were rifling it, it through? It wasn't in a big bag of money. Did you then walk away paranoid? <laughs> because I would if I take took a twenty off the was street. It, was it secretly marked? Am I now tracked? <laughs> That's it. So I would be lying awake thinking through all the scenarios that a criminal gang had marked it the police had marked it and if i spend it anywhere that i'm going oh, I'm, to be I'm, banged up for 24 oh, years i'm gonna buy sweets I'm, no, we'll take it to one of those american candy shops yeah, that exactly. are clearly a front <laughs> <laughs> use it to buy something nefarious yes. and everything's fine I'll take it there and buy like three m&ms <laughs> <laughs> well what do you think people a answer our moral dilemma yeah, what would, what you, would do? you do if you did find, like the people in the story did, find a huge bag, several bags several of money bags of cash. in the woods and you're with someone, let's say you're with someone, there's no one else around, there clearly weren't, what's your thinking mm, on the matter? Intriguing. What do you also think of the great train robbery about the escape plans of all the criminals involved? Did you know the stories? Do you know more of it? Do you know anyone who was involved? Because apparently everyone does. Should more criminals have their own merch lines? <laughs> Would you buy I don't from know. it? <laughs> well, actually, dark tourism. Oh, yeah. Think about that. How many people pay for that? Absolutely. But I think Ronnie Biggs is weirder. You are just going to someone's barbecue and yeah. you're like, oh, okay, I brought uh, some sausages. And they're like, so I robbed a train. You're like, oh, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> now buy a T-shirt with my face on it. And it's like, no, that was an awful birthday. Sorry. <laughs> But tell us what you think and what you would do in those scenarios. Mm. Jump on the comments Intrigued. of this episode wherever you listen to it. Tell us your thoughts, your theories. But most importantly, oh, yes. you have to mix up. A caprina. Yes. Oh, yes. Temper the sugar. Do to your own personal taste. To your own Absolutely taste. Absolutely whatever you like. But get a bottle of Cajasa. <sighs> get it in. Chuck it in the fridge. Leave yeah. it there. Smash up some limes. Have a jolly old time. It's easy. You've got friends around. You're yep. on your veranda. Exactly. You're on the beach. You're standing in your living room. Doesn't yep. matter. You have two or three of them. You're on the floor anyway. So, <laughs> Hopefully with your friends. With your friends. Having a nice... Just playing PlayStation or something. Or having sex. I don't know. <laughs> what do you like doing with your friends? You crack on. As long as everyone's consenting. Exactly. It's fine. You have a grand time. <laughs> Whether you like it limey and strong and see through time like Nick or me, you like it a little sweet. Mix one up and tell us what you are drinking this weekend or in your lives whenever you're listening to this episode. Please leave us a review on Apple iTunes if you haven't already and come and find us on TikTok and send us more suggestions of videos we could be doing on there. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh, yeah.